Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. If you've spent the weekend trying to find the real you, you've been wasting your time, according to the writer and philosopher John Gray. The idea of self-realisation, he writes in his latest book, is one of the most destructive of modern fictions. He takes issue with some other cherished modern notions too, including ideas of progress, civilization, and the powers of human reason. It is not, to put it mildly, an entirely flattering portrait of our species. Two of my other guests this morning have also seen the less attractive aspects of their fellow human beings recently. The writer James Lasden describes the unnerving experience of being the object of a former student's obsessive malice in his book Give Me Everything You Have on Being Stalked. And the classicist Mary Beard has found herself on the receiving end of a wild outpouring of internet abuse. Also on the programme, the playwright Mark Ravenhill, currently writer-in-residence at the Royal Shakespeare Company and whose new translation of Brecht's A Life of Galileo has just finished playing at the Swan Theatre in Stratford. Mark's next play is a response to Voltaire's uh, Candide, that great satire on Enlightenment optimism. Uh, Mark, we'll come back to you, but I want to start with you, uh, John Gray. You've written about Voltaire, I know, before now. Uh, an odd character for you in some ways congenial, because he did satirise that notion of optimism, but in other sense he's not a great hero figure of the Enlightenment. Um, for you in this new book, The Silence of the Animals, the Enlightenment is the target slightly, isn't it? Well, I suppose what I've been trying to do in this book and other books is to demythologize the Enlightenment, because what people say nowadays is that we have to cling on to Enlightenment values and they're terribly important, and the way they talk about it, it's as if the Enlightenment was something like a religious faith, which if we gave it up, there'd be chaos and um, mayhem in the world. But the Enlightenment that they're talking about isn't the Enlightenment that actually existed. For example, Voltaire, although in many ways a very admirable um, human being, also promoted the pre-Adamite theory of human origins, according to which Jews were remnants of a pre-human species. Uh, Kant, although a very admirable Enlightenment philosopher, perhaps the supreme Enlightenment philosopher, um, wrote of Jews as a um, nation of cheats and that their religion wasn't a real religion. Um, so the kind of the picture of the Enlightenment that people now invoke when they say we should hang on to it is like the picture of Christianity that people invoke when they say that without some transcendental faith there'll be nihilism, there'll be despair, there'll be pessimism, there'll be general disaster and ruination. And if you say, well, what about all the crimes of Christianity, like the Inquisition and uh, witch hunts and so they say, well, that's not the essence of Christianity. Christianity is to do with love. It's a religion of love. How could that? Now, I think that's childish. I think that's just a childish evasion of the fact that Christianity was implicated in these crimes. And I think the same about the Enlightenment. There's well, no... There's no quintessential form, as I say, even the greatest representatives of the Enlightenment had some pretty horrible beliefs and attitudes. One of the standard narrative ways of coping with that would be to say, well, you know, that, that was a period in history, mm. there were different views back then, mm. we have improved, we've moved on, mm. we've learned, and mm. we've learned from Voltaire and, and he's taught us things. Now, you take issue with that slightly as well. Well, you? I guess one thing I'm not persuaded by that is you could say, well, of course, they were earlier times and um, we can't expect Voltaire to be enlightened in every way. But, of course, remember, all these Enlightenment thinkers did claim to be much more enlightened than anyone else at the time. They did claim to be in the vanguard of human uh, thought and human advance, and yet they embodied some pretty awful beliefs. But my general view is that gains in civilization, such as the emancipation of women, the prohibition of torture, better treatment for prisoners... Um, they're all real. That's to say, civilization isn't something I explode or attack. My attitude is more like that of Joseph Conrad, who learnt what civilization could do in the name of civilization in the Congo, but never ceased to be a great defender of civilization. But the difference between what I'm arguing and the Enlightenment is that uh, all of the advantages of civilization. I think can be lost, uh, each of the advantages can be lost very quickly and very easily. For example, if 10 years ago you'd said, uh, as I did say, in fact, that torture might be rehabilitated and even rehabilitated by a liberal regime, in this case the United States, 
that what had been torture in the past, uh, um, waterboarding would be uh, reinvented as a form of interrogation and, and promoted. If you'd said that, that would have been seen, was seen at the time, as a kind of willful piece of perverse misanthropy and pessimism. But it happened. And it happened very quickly. Uh, and even though there's been some, there's been resistance to it, I'm not really convinced that torture of that kind isn't still being practised. And there are still people, such as the former American vice president, who defend it. So the difference between science and technology, in which progress is just a fact, and meaning by progress means cumulative advance, advance which is hard to reverse, very difficult to reverse, and advances in civilization, is that advances in civilization are very easy to reverse. Uh, and that's all the more reason for hanging on to them. So the big modern myth is that ethics and politics can be like science and technology. But the difference is this. Whatever happens in the world now, universities aren't going to start teaching alchemy again. Uh, however, it's very easily possible, and has in fact happened, that persecution of gypsies has re-emerged in Central Europe, in Hungary and other countries... Hatred of immigrants and gays so has re-emerged in... Your, in, essen in, your essential yeah. case is that we, we, we falsely regard mm. these gains in civilization as being solid and permanent, mm. and in fact they're far more fragile than mm. we care to think. Uh, 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 Mary Beard, I just yeah, want to and they're also, I think you point to the way they're kind of nicely mythical or also dangerously mythical. And yes. I, I thought, for me, what was very pleasurable about reading the book was that, as a classicist, it spoke to me. Okay. Because the it, one of the things that's hardest to get your head around when you go back to the ancient world is that the, the, the Greeks and Romans myth about progress mm. is precisely the reverse of our own. Mm. <laughs> that, you know, that what every Greek and Roman writer, so far as we know, thought was that things are basically getting worse. Mm. And if you want to find mm. the time when humanity mm. was at mm. its height ethically and politically. Mm. It's not in the future, heaven knows. It's in the, the deep, distant past of the Golden mm. Age. Mm. And it, that's always a very hard idea, the kind mm. of backward-looking philosophy. Yes. is terribly hard for us to get our head I completely around. agree. Well, that, there is a, still mm. a strain in modern conservatism that would think exactly that, wouldn't it, mm. that we're all, we're all going downhill. And, and it would be possible mm. to read your book and think, to a certain degree, that you're saying don't don't, be, don't have any illusions. Things are not getting We're not better. all going downhill because I treat, as Mary just said, I treat the idea that um, there's a, uh, some much better state in the past or at some earlier stage of human history as also a myth. But the idea that Mary was talking about, I think, lasted right into the 18th century. The idea that you either had to go into the deep past or off the map to find a good society. For example, in John, Samuel Johnson's Rasselas, a hidden a country which is not on the map. That stayed around for a long time. The difference changed sometime in the 17th or 18th century when, when uh, not just utopias but much better societies were projected in the future. And I think these are all myths and, and what we should, the, what we should just get used to is that goods and evils recur and what civilization is about is finding... Uh, effective expedients against the recurring evils. Yeah. What is the? Uh, that's the. That's the, the mm. sharp question, there, mm. isn't it? What do you do if you say, well, utopianism is a folly, mm. and meliorism, just making things better, a little mm. bit day by day, mm. that's a delusion too. Mm. What do you actually do day by day? Because I mean, you get up, you publish <laughs> books, you you don't lie in bed thinking it's all pointless. Well, remember that the belief in progress that I'm criticising is recent. The myth of progress that I'm creating is basically 18th century onwards. And so what were people doing throughout all of human history before then? As Mary has just pointed out in the ancient world of Greece and Rome, they didn't think the future was going to be better and better. They thought the past was better and the future and everything was getting worse. Yeah, the, question, the question was how you recaptured the past. The past. Yes. Um, there are times, though, aren't there, when things do get better? I mean, I I think, when, I, when, I think, within I, historical I think, memory. Well, look, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yeah. during my... My Mark. childhood up to my my teens, from the sort of working class background that my parents came from, we had a sort of material basis for a sort of sense a sense of progress. Mm. My parents would drive us around at the car and mm. point at schools and hospitals and leisure centres and things. Mm. We just didn't have those, mm. and you've got those, and they were able to show us that within our lifetimes, there there yeah. had been material progress. Mm. I think what's strangely odd is that actually, although we've got a lot less. Uh, grounds for sort of optimism. Mm. Certainly, people from working class, low middle class background, mm. uh, we've we've absorbed a largely sort mm. of Californian sort of ethos of optimism. So people today seem to be 
in general, even more optimistic than my parents mm. were, but with a lot less <laughs> material foundation for that. Mm. One of the James things I, I liked about the book is that you acknowledge the need to have some kind of myth, even yes. though we persecute ourselves with the myth and yes. we torment ourselves yeah. and we continually or cyclically destroy our civilizations mm. with new myths. Mm. We don't. The, the, the end point after you've destroyed a myth isn't mythlessness necessarily. Yeah. It's that a is new myth. A myth. Well, that's itself a myth. And you, mm. your book moves to this place, which you define in almost the terms of poetry, of Wallace yeah. Stevens' poetry yeah. specifically, yeah. of, of the, the supreme fiction, yeah. um, which I would like to, to, to yeah. hear what you, you say something about that. There was a fascinating echo, actually, as you mentioned Wallace Stevens. You, you write in early in the book about Orwell and about that terrifying scene where O'Brien, the torturer, says, you know, you're going to see... Four fingers, I forget how many, however many it is, whatever he's holding up. And he says, I don't want you just to pretend that you can see them. I want you to truly believe it. Yes. And a little mm. later, you, you quote Wallace Stevens, uh, a line of poetry. The exquisite truth is to know that it is a fiction and to believe in it mm. willingly, mm. Uh, which is sort of O'Brien mm. in a different form. Isn't Although it? Wallace Stevens didn't imagine anyone being tortured into, <laughs> into believing that. But isn't I, there a kinship between those no, two? No, the, the key, one of the key things I'm arguing, and here I'm the view I'm putting forward is quite different from many other critic of myths, critics of myths, is that having criticised some myths as shallow or even dangerous myths, the idea that once you've got rid of an evil like slavery or torture or anti-Semitism or hatred of gays or homophobia, it's not going to come back. The idea that once it's there, once it's been prohibited or it's sort of, that's settled, we can move on to further things, that I think is a, is a dangerous myth. But as James has just pointed out, I'm not criticising myth as such, but even more, I don't think there is such a thing as a supreme fiction for all human beings, or even for any single human being. I think one of the things that, that uh, Stevens wrote in his wonderful essays on his own poetry is that um, uh, myths must change, not just in history, but even in the life of an individual. But it, no, it, if, it, if we get too hung up on a particular metaphysical or mythical representation of our lives, I think you're already in dangerous territory. Um, you had a, a line, an anxious attachment to belief is the chief weakness of the Western mind. Is yes. that what you mean by that? that yes, we've, yes. We fixate. But then once you've removed that belief, uh, you're in a place where you're not, you're not moulding your life around truths as you see them. You're moulding them around fictions which work temporarily. Is that that mine? Um, you can... That is really what I'm um, talking about. But, of course, it's important, I think, here to say that the idea that belief is at the core of things like religions, or even, I would say, of myths, is a sort of recent idea. I think uh, one of the Mark useful Ravenhead. things religion does do as a, as a myth, as a, as a system of thought, mm -hmm. is it does allow us... It does include notions of suffering yes. and mortality. Yes. And I think in that way, it, it's got advanced on some other systems yes. of thought, enlightenment thought, is that actually... Uh, apart from some sort of best-selling misery memoirs, mm. which is sort of almost the exception to the rule, talk of morbidity, suffering, is almost excluded from our from our dialogue. And I, I, th mm. I think your, your book sort of acknowledges yeah. that actually yeah. religion does encompass some areas of life that we find otherwise we're ignoring. I'm going to take that cue because I just want to turn to James Lasden. Mm. You used the phrase best-selling misery memoir. Misery <laughs> memoir would be a very inaccurate phrase for this book. It's very carefully written. I, you might like the phrase best-selling to be applied well, to it. Um, <laughs> just tell us about it. You've written about the experience of essentially being stalked. Cyber-stalked. Cyber-stalked. Yeah. Cyber now, why is that an important distinction for you? Well, it's... It, it's because, I mean, that's the medium through which I was stalked, was the internet, uh, emails, uh, po online postings. Um, and I think that, that that is significant. It's different from being somebody appearing on my doorstep. Uh, it's also different from... Phone stalking, although it did actually turn into phone stalking. I think um, the internet has facilitated a certain kind of stalker mentality that might actually, in some cases, not have emerged in some people. Uh, I was uh, interested. I mean, I was uh, reading John and reading about technology and the advance yeah. of technology and the way in which people can mistake it, as it were, for an improvement in ethics. I was, well, I was I curious really, whether you thought it really did release, has released something new uh, rather uh, than an old thing uh, in a new form. I think it possibly has. And, and I think every major technology does bring in new ethical questions. And, I mean, I think of your, your play, your version of Galileo, uh, 
is, is very much about that. Is, uh, you know, with the uh, astronomy of Galileo comes, well, as Brecht frames it, the question of does God exist? And that was deeply troubling to... to yeah, I mean, I think the church's response was very much, it doesn't actually really quite matter what whether the science is true or not. It, it's the ethical implications and the, and the political implications of what you're saying. The, the truth of the science is sort of open to debate. The church was prepared to accept that, but what they weren't prepared to accept was the massive ethical questions that it raised. Right. Um, James, just to go back to you, can you just describe, for listeners who don't know about it, the actual experience, what actually happened? For five years and on, on, and going on, uh, I have been sent hate mails to myself. I've, ha- I've been the target of a smear campaign by a former student who began accusing me on the internet or emailing employers of plagiarism, sexual misconduct, then began threatening me, my family. It didn't, it didn't start us. No, it started as a, she had been a student of mine, a very talented, I thought, a very talented student. Two years after she graduated, uh, she contacted me, asked me to help her with her novel. I couldn't, I didn't have time, but I, I thought well enough of her to put her in touch with my agent. My agent put her in touch with a, an editor. And in fact, the three of us have been uh, at different, uh, different times and together targeted by her, uh, by this campaign that she's been waging ever since things went wrong. And she and I, in this early phase, had a very amicable correspondence. Then she became sort of amorous and made it clear that she was expecting this to turn into a, an affair. And I told her that I was happily married. And she took it very well initially. And we continued corresponding. And then the volume of her correspondence just went up and up. And I, I started realizing I was becoming the object of an obsession. I stopped answering them. Then they turned overnight in the summer of 2007 to vitriolic hate mail, anti- this strange explosion of anti-Semitism, which I had seen no sign of before, uh, which I found very, very weird and surprising. And this this very... And she declared that she was going to ruin me, and she proceeded to try to do that, and she's very, very good at it. And, it, and I felt, even if it wasn't the case, very close to being ruined. Um, an awful experience. Writing about it raises two questions, and it raises an ethical question as to you know, what you're entitled to do as a writer. But also the practical question, were you nervous about tackling this in a book and, as it were, pouring petrol on the fire? Well, it it, it does raise those questions. I mean, on the first one, this is somebody who has escalated constantly uh, to the point where she's just making violent threats, uh, trying to contact my children, threatening, you know, really serious threats. The police are involved now. They've taken it up since since, uh, I finished the book. It's now in the hands of the uh, hate crimes unit of the NYPD. I felt, after five years, justified in, in, in writing about somebody who had very systematically tried to destroy me uh, as a writer, as a teacher, and as a human being, very consciously articulated that precise aim herself. I did feel justified in doing that. But I'm aware that some people will think, you're not, you know, that, that, that I shouldn't have done that. It's a very um, interesting and delicate thing because to write honestly about it requires you to write about your own responses, particularly at the beginning. I mean, she accuses you of... She, she writes in an email, as, uh, I think, describing you to somebody else. She says... She was someone he could get a little lift from in the midst of his midlife. You're very honest about the kind of flirtatiousness of those early and yeah. the, the sense of friendship and kind of a little bit of, I don't know, excitement or appeal or attraction there. Um, yeah. Was it difficult writing about that? Because that in itself might... Everything about this, <laughs> this whole experience has been extremely uncomfortable and difficult, but also sort of interesting. Um, but writing about it was the only way that I could get any relief from it in the first place. And although it hasn't brought it to an end, it has made the, 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 the sort of very oppressive emotional part of it easier to bear. And was that a process of shaping? Because you also you write very interestingly in the book about thinking about how to write it. And you acknowledge at one point that you might have reordered events for an artistic and then uh, I decided, sort of, not and then to, you decided because I not to. The, but... the only way, I mean, the the, the book it has as its sort of central spine is just the account of this stalking that just goes from bad to worse and worse. And then I have these digressions into things that that that, that it raised it, it, subjects that interested me, like reputation, uh, these sort of rather antiquated idea of honour that seems to have been revived 
I think, by, by the internet, or reputation anyway, has, has acquired that a new is value. The, that's the terribly interesting thing, is that you have this very, very new technology which brings into play, I think you're very interesting in the book about that, a, a rather archaic notion of communal standing and social standing. Well, I, th- I think that's where Mary Beard. What, um, what James is doing is extremely interesting because although, and as you say, there are, this, this happens to loads and loads of people, this is not terribly uncommon, nevertheless it's not something, if it's not happened to you, that you have any clue about the insidious threats and... I thought actually trying to lay that out reasonably dispassionately was terribly important. And it was really terribly important, I mean, not just in the kind of misery memoir um, stakes, but really in, in helping us get to grips with what the morality and ethics and and code of conduct on, on the internet is like. And I, I mean, it does seem to me that people do things that are very unpleasant on the web, but it also seems to me that we haven't yet remotely begun to think about what is the right way of using the opportunities that the web can give us. I mean, you know, not a single one of us around this table experienced Twitter, um, you know, earlier than perhaps three or four years ago. You know, all the other kind of ways we have of human interaction. You know, we've been taught by mum and dad, you know, you go into the street and you step on someone's toe and you say, I'm sorry, and there is a kind of sense of boundaries and barriers that, that, that you learn as a kid. I, I mean, I think the internet is both scary extremely exciting at the moment because we're still defining what those rules might be and it's, it's really helped by actually seeing an instant like this. Um, it is rather odd though, isn't it, that given a new social space, I mean rather unnerving too, that given an, a, a completely new social space without rules people seem <laughs> to revert to a kind of barbarism and I mean not everybody, that would be far too pessimistic, but there I, is a degree of I, violence. I, I think they resort to barbarism but it, it's also one of the, for, for me, it's been one of the media through which I've had most you know, human, decent reasonable support, you know I don't think the internet is any worse mm. than humankind in general No, mm. but, 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 and it, some but it brings a lot of people to your door that as it were would never have had a but maybe, presence in your life, and maybe it's a, in some ways, maybe it's a good idea that we see that. I, mean, I think, I think some, some of those questions will just work themselves out over time. Uh, the questions of, I, I mean, I think particularly schools will, as they have with bullying, will deal with making kids aware that it's despicable and disgusting to do certain kinds of things, and and people will just kind of have that reflex not to do it. I think we might have skipped a generation. And there's, there's just one thing: there's many people who actually write very nasty things to you on the web. Very many of those, if you reply and say, I'm sorry, I'm not like that, I'm not evil, I'm not stupid, will write back and apologise. But that's this curious thing of, of, as it were, a virtual character called Mary Beard Mm. that they don't seem to attach to. I mean, I noticed, Mark, a long time ago, about 20 years ago, starting to notice groups of people watching the television that actually the television was largely, in 1984, more, more than the 50 minutes of hate or whatever, it was three hours of hate, that actually if you sit three people in front of the television for an evening, they will say, look how badly dressed they are, look how fat they are, look how stupid they are. And before they just said that to the television, and any, any of us who are on the television are, do become not quite real. And now, just with the possibility to use your laptop or your, or your iPhone, you can translate that straight into a message that goes out to the world. But I think we've always had, or ever since the television or maybe the radio, we've always had that strange thing where there's this thing in the corner that we can rail at. John Gray, in your book you write about the way the Nazis Mm. used internal enemies um, Mm -hmm. as a way of creating euphoria in an an essentially controlled population. Mm. It's a kind of interesting moment in the book. But I wondered whether you thought there was anything similar to that going on here that we need, we require um, at some level, at some base level, uh, a set of enemies and that Twitter is, for example, is very good at, at creating a sudden mob and you have a sense of a mob, you have a sense that there are a lot of people with you, you're in company and well, you can not collectively... all human beings, I would even say not, you know, not even most human beings require an enemy in their lives to give it meaning most of the time but it does seem there does seem to be a, a, a human syndrome, which has recurred throughout history in different parts of the world, in which what on individual levels might be an obsession, but also involves some of the pathologies of European history and so on. 
um, that obsession seems to function in some sort of way as giving meaning to the lives of the people who have it. And in the in the book, I cite someone who actually had experienced Nazism, a liberal German journalist called Sebastian Hafner, who escaped in 1938 to England. And the question he... And he'd seen Nazism from the start and before the start and had been close to it and had observed it and experienced it very closely himself. And the question he raised was, I think a kind of very interesting question, is whether the persecutory aspects of that movement, which were actually the essence of it, in my view anyway, were actually played some part in the collective or communal happiness that he thought it had generated among those sections of the German population that weren't themselves victims of persecution. It's not to say that all human beings um, have this persecutory potential, but certainly it can recur and has recurred throughout history. Where it's different in the Internet is the peculiar immediacy of the Internet mixed with the fact that what actually people, what people are attacking when they attack, when people are attacked through the internet, is a virtual person, not the person themselves. Mary, you're looking pain. Yeah, I'm looking looking a bit pain because John's (laughs) taking us down a very gloomy path and uh, (laughs) I actually think that that actually things aren't going to be so bad and I'd like to... I didn't say they would be. I'd like to think that in 15, 20 years' time we'll pick up James's book and we'll see a path that the internet didn't actually mostly take us down. It will become a historical document of that strange moment when we were feeling our way. And I think that we will, I hope, that we will come to a a, a set of manners on the internet, which is basically will come down to nothing much more than saying, you know, you treat somebody on the web like you treat them if you're mm. face-to-face with them. And that will still mean that some people are horrible. But it, we will actually draw back from this... Do you expect this, them, James? M- mad anonymity and persecution. I, I, I think there'll be, there'll be some of... I think that things will improve on the basic sort of etiquette level, without any doubt. I, I think, unfortunately, obsession, hatred, <laughs> violent feelings of one kind or another, we'll always find a way out and a way to express We always go to say bad things on Twitter sometimes. You know, I've said things that I've really regretted on Twitter, but what will happen is we'll be able to actually say, sorry, I didn't mean that. Please forgive me. It isn't an entirely new impulse. You've you've, Mm. um, spoken and written rather brilliantly about Roman graffiti, which in in lots of ways (laughs) contains many of these impulses. I mean, your new book is confronting the classics. Um, in, In a certain sense... Um, John's arguments are congenial to you, aren't they? That there is no great novelty in the world, that we are not modern uh, in relation to the ancients. We are, in a similar sense, them. That's true, and the ancients were as nasty to each other as we Mm. can possibly be. And I think the difference, and this is where there is... The the technological change makes a big difference, Mm. is that when you got up and abused someone in a Roman court, you were doing it face-to-face. When you wrote a poem, you were normally signing it, even if you did start to Mm. speculate horribly about their sexual practices. And it's... we we have lost that sense of immediacy. This is not the rancher in Hyde Park who's mm. spouting some really appalling political doctrine or attractive political doctrine. Mm. This is uh, something which appears to be mm. kind of safe. You can go home and you can get your laptop out and you can write mm. vile things mm. late at night. And I suspect we'll stop doing that. I mean, I, I, I might be proved... Wrong, you know. I might, you know, if I live that long, I might in thirty years be sitting here, uh, you know, confronting memoir after memoir like James's. <laughs> but I hope that we're now feeling our way towards something which will not stop people being horrible. We're never going to stop people being horrible, but to give some sense of what we commonly think's okay. But this um, is just one way, though, isn't it? I mean, the, the odd thing about this technology is the combination or the fusion of intimacy and anonymity. Mm. Uh, which previous technologies like the book or the letter or the or the court uh, but, didn't give. But you see that on email even. It's not That's just Twitter. True. I mean, the That's number true. of kisses yeah. I get on emails mm. far outweighs <laughs> the number of kisses that I ever got on a, in a letter. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also the casualness of your response, I think. In, it creates yeah. a sense of intimacy, yeah. doesn't it? The immediacy with which you can flick back an answer to, to a question yeah. from a stranger you've never mm. met, never will meet. Uh, Mary Beard. In your case, one interesting thing that happened was you went on question time and you did suffer this kind of awful sort of internet attack. 
But then, as it were, the internet rallied mm. to your yeah. defence as well. I mean, a, a, any mob that's created will very quickly create mm. a counter mob as well. And I think, you know, in, in some ways, I, I think I was doing it in a much kind of more trivial and immediate way what James is doing, saying that uh, you're told when something like that happens to you that you should, you know, just shut up and put up because otherwise you will draw attention to it. Yeah. And actually, I think, you know, ultimately, you've got to say, excuse me, guys, you know, no, you know, no that is no, that no, is no. that is not <laughs> on. You know, if you were in a bar and I was overhearing that, I would go up to you and I'd say, "Sorry, can you go outside?" And that it seems to me you've just got to show a red card. And actually, I mean, it's not always going to work. And I, you know, I would be really naive if I thought I'd made any real inroad into the bigger picture. But it's a little inroad into mm-hmm. saying. Stop it. And you also um, talk no. about the question of, I mean, how far do you empathise with somebody who does that and how far do you just deal with somebody who's done that? This was an issue that. for you as well, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, it's quite late in your book that you, uh, James, sort of acknowledge the possibility, which I think occurs to a reader much earlier because her, her rants really are mad. That she's crazy, yeah. Uh, you think, well, actually, she needs psychiatric help. And, I mean, I, it makes it no easier to be on the... Well, I, you know, I, I, I didn't feel that I could diagnose her. Uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, and I didn't think that I could conduct my own investigation into what was going on in psychiatric terms because I don't, I don't have the, I, I don't have the, the authority to do that. And I, to be frank, don't really fully believe them. As sort of, I don't think that they're any more scientific, really, than than the mythical terms that I do use or the the terms of from literature, myth, poetry, and history. Uh, and just human experience that I that that I felt that I could sincerely draw on uh, and 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 create my own investigation uh, using. So, but I felt I also had to address the fact of was she mentally ill, and if so, does that I- I- exonerate her in any way uh, uh, from res- responsibility? And I, I think it's a difficult question to answer. But uh, did the experience leave you more? We're talking about optimism and pessimism. Did the experience leave you more pessimistic about life in general? Or would you? Well, I don't expect this. I don't. I haven't come to the place where I sort of expect this of people as a matter of course. But <laughs> but one thing one thing is that I, I, that really but an eruption me. of the irrational like that into your life. It's can. a shock. Yeah, and 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 it. It, it sort of ground on for such a long time that it really mm. pushed me to the limits of what I could endure, and uh, that has an effect on you when you when you go through an experience like that. It, you you don't come out of it feeling exactly mm. the same. Um, Mary, just quickly, you don't sound at all um, pessimistic. You sound I wouldn't describe you as Panglossian, but um, you, you're you're clearly optimistic about the future. Does that partly come from the study of the classics? Is that a, is that a, <laughs> an academic knowledge that makes you, that reassures you about human? Um. I'd like I'd like Tom to say yes, but, but it's I, what it's but not true. Actually, in truth, <laughs> I think it just comes from you know being in your mid fifties, having been around a bit, and feeling reasonably self confident and confident enough to say say stop it. Uh, Mark, I'm going to turn to you because you're you're thinking a lot about all of this kind of thing at the moment with, with a, a play about Candide. Why did you want to have what you've described as a conversation with? With Condide, it is a conversation with Condide, is it, rather than with Voltaire? A, a little bit of both. Yeah. I sort of thought there's lots going on in Condide and optimism, and there's something going on there. So I sort of plucked a title and then had the time really to to think about it. But I suppose I was sort of overwhelmed by pessimism a couple of years ago when it, you know, really struck me that actually the whole of the advances of the welfare state and the betterment of my class of people that you know gradually developed over 150 years had probably been reversed and and I found that you know, alongside finally getting my head around the implications of climate change which I hadn't been a, an all out denier of but I'd just been sort of putting on the, on the back burner for another day and the combination of those two things are just sort of overwhelmed by a great wash of pessimism but as you said earlier, still getting up in the morning and you know doing my stuff and writing my plays and actually on a day-to-day basis meeting somebody like Mary as I would today, I'd be pretty chippy and happy, you know, happy. And uh, and I thought that's a really curious contradiction to be to be living moment by moment. And I thought I suppose it's the pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will sort of stuff. Um, and I got sort of fascinated by that. And I thought, where are other people at 
on the optimism scale. So I started using Twitter and Facebook and having a conversation with people. Not just with people you knew. It was like well, a kind of you know, open got, survey, was yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. My, my, you know, my few Your thousand, followers. My Say few, the embarrassing My word. few thousand followers. <laughs> I know, it just sounds like a disciple, doesn't it? A few thousand followers. And I thought they'd be somewhere on the same optimism scale as me. And I found that people were ridiculously optimistic. So I started firing... More, first of all, I just said, how optimistic do you feel? And then I started firing more and more questions, like saying, you know, there's significant evidence that the planet may be uninhabitable for your children or your grandchildren. How, do you, how does that make you feel? And people said, well, that's all fine. We'll just climb up to higher places and enough of us, enough of us survive. Or it's OK, Sci scientists have always solved problems in the past. They'll, they'll solve this one. And then I said, you know, it, the chances are that economically, as each generation goes by, the situation's going to be worse. Well, who needs money anyway? We're, you know, the other value. And I just thought... Th I was, I'm very unscientific, obviously. It was a few thousand people, but I was getting this nutty picture of this sort of madly optimistic society. And I think we've replaced... Gen genuinely panglossy. Yeah, and, I mean, yeah. I think we've replaced something sort of 30, 40 years ago, which was, I think if you ask my parents, how's life? They're going, it's all right, you know, getting by, I'm surviving. But actually they had material grounds for feeling quite optimistic. And I think we've reversed the situation. The actual evidence for optimism is getting scanter and scanter, mm. but we've upped the ante in terms of just when you meet people in a corridor, how are you? Nowadays, they say, I'm doing just great. There's very few people any left who will say, getting by, <laughs> which used to be the standard British response 25 years now, ago. Now, do you think that's a kind of delusive defence mechanism? I suppose by your lights it would be. It's, it's a way of... Well, you know, the whole question of optimism and pessimism is a sort of touchy-feely way of discussing much deeper issues. And the deeper issues are some of those that Mark been talking about, which is what kind of experience do we draw on? And also, do we have a, sh a shallow myth or a deep myth? Now, the deep myths that have consoled and guided humankind throughout its history, the myth of Genesis, some of the Greek myths, for example, contain both the light and the dark. They contain both irreparable loss and tremendous gratitude for being in the world and having the chances we do have. What's significant about these myths now, and this is why people always frame this in terms of an issue of optimism and pessimism, is I get the sense that it's extremely unpersuasive and unconvinced, this optimism that people assert. It's willful, it's almost hysterical at yeah, times. I, I think it's reached the point of, of hysteria. The only point that I could get some people to even shift on a bit was death. I said, look, how, <laughs> how, is, how is this huge optimism possible when we're, you know, the absolutely no, basic thing we know is that we're going to die. Nobody of my circle of friends denied death, but some people lots did of say... Lots people do oh, now. Did, did, some people, lots of people lot, quite a lot of people did say, I, I don't think about it, I, I don't acknowledge death. They weren't saying it didn't exist, but yeah. the majority of people were saying, I, or you've caught me there, because what I, what I do is I never, ever think about death. Put that off till later. Mary Beard. I'm not sure how far we're really dealing with deep feelings of optimism and pessimism here or a kind of revolutionary change in rhetoric. And I think mm. I would talk about mm. exactly what you talk about, but I would put it in terms of, oh, look, you know, the whole British rhetoric of, of self-irony and self-deprecation has gone mm. in favour of, you know, some kind mm. of American upbeat. That's what it seems to me. Yeah. When I, when I, I come back... I agree of, with that. Uh, I live in the States and I come back maybe twice a year and every time I come back it seems as if the rhetoric, the general rhetoric of life here has become more American and less British that as it used to be. That may be part of the difference and between the people you talk to now and your parents' generation. They're, they're, they're watching more American TV, they're hearing more people yeah, saying... Yeah, no, I, th I think feeling, we really yeah. have absorbed, even if most of the population haven't read them, the sort of Californian self-help, yeah. sort of I'm inventing myself every day, I'm, yeah. you know, but, everything's But ironically, we've, we've, we've absorbed, absorbed it that. at the very moment when its, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> origin and, it, and the fountain of it is, is experiencing... Well, that's why, that's why it's so attractive. Uh, that's why people cling on to it and get angry when it's questioned or criticised, because they actually feel... I think somewhere as you do. I mean, they look around, they see their children haven't got jobs, they've got no pension, they're living from month to month, which actually wasn't true 20 or 30 years ago. The welfare state is severely eroded. They see all these insecurities and then they insist with a yeah. kind of adamant... There's, there's a rhetorical compulsion to say, I'm having a great day. Yes, well... Yeah. But, but there must <laughs> come a point where that collapses. I, I mean, think there if must you, be, that's what interests me. Yeah. Are we, when, when do we... Re I mean, Judex says it's the Roadrunner cartoon, isn't it? That we've run off the edge of the cliff, mm. but we haven't looked 
look down yet, but as soon as you look down, you can run in mid-air for quite a way as Roadrunner, mm. but then when you look down, zoop, and where where does the turning point well, come? Well, the, the one argument might be don't look down. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the business but of cultivating living, if you're living your garden. If you were living in somewhere like Greece today, you couldn't help looking down. You wouldn't have the choice. Because when you went to get your medication for yourself or your child, it wouldn't be there. Yeah, and I was in Spain a couple of weeks ago and I was very aware similar. that the yeah. whole yeah. Very language, language was, has changed. If 60% of people under 25 are unemployed, they don't have the choice not to look down. They're forced to. But you don't have a choice not to look down. You, you really have no choice, though, as a human being, not to have a certain degree of expectation that the future will be better than the past. Otherwise, you would kill no, yourself. No, no, you wouldn't. What I've been there recently, and what a lot of people, actually, I talked to, they're mostly graduates, but they said that people are emigrating. So I said, well, where are you going to? Some said um, Brazil, they're learning Portuguese. Some said um, Germany, they're learning German. Some said America or Africa. So, in other words... These are young people with their lives before them. They're not lying in bed all day, or some of them might. Most of them are taking on board the situation in which they find themselves. They're realists, but they still think that life will be better in Africa. Or Well, it might very well might yeah. be. Yeah. I mean, it's not the whole world. It's just Europe that's gotten itself into this ridiculous bind. But as a demythologizer, what do you tell them? I mean, what's, what's, what, what, what... I've been asked this, so I said, look, I don't give advice, I'm not a priest, but if I was your age, I'd probably be considering the options you're considering. Cultivate your garden. No. No? Not cultivate Emigrate. your garden? Well, cultivate because, a garden because <laughs> there are Basically, you can say, stay here and fight, or you can mm. say, emigrate. And my view is this kind of bind that Europe's in is probably 10 or 20 years. If you're 25, you don't want to wait till you're 50. OK, well, there's some practical advice for you from John Gray. His book, The Silence of Animals, is out now, as is James Lasden's Give Me Everything You Have on Being Stalked. Candide, a new comedy by Mark Ravenhill, inspired by Voltaire, will be on at the Swan Theatre in Stratford-upon-Avon from the end of August. And Mary Beard's new book, Confronting the Classics, is also out now. Next week, Stephanie Flanders' guests include the novelist Chimananda Ngozi Adichie, talking about her new book, Americana. But for now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk, where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.